To doubt your own existence is to exist, as you cannot doubt it if you did not exist in the first place. This is the main concept presented by René Descartes when he says, I think therefore I am. But can anything that thinks be considered truly alive? Or rather, does something need to be alive to think? With today's advancements in technology bringing artificial intelligence and robotics, we might be inclined to answer no to this question. A machine is after all just making calculations and following algorithms to mimic that which we interpret as intelligence. But does the same system not work on the human brain? Not so much with zeros and ones, but synapses in our brain that work in congruence with a complex system of stimuli that end up just working as a machine, an organic one rather than a metal one. Our emotions, although controlled by the limb system, are just like programs on a machine to create the correct response to different situations. Our own DNA is represented by A, C, G, and T. The building blocks that describe how each one of us is specifically made, as a machine lines of code make each program what they are and give them their purpose. So you might think, ah, yes, that's where it is, that's the difference. A machine follows our orders, our instructions, they do not have any free will. And to that I ask, do any of us? I mean, is there really not a set path for each one of us based on our upbringings, our environment? We may think that our choices are what brought us here. But, were those choices not affected by our surroundings? Were you truly making your own path, or just following the tracks presented to you in life? As we continue to experience advancements in our technology, I believe it necessary for each one of us to understand and question our perspective in this matter. Although we're not quite there yet, we can look into science fiction to look for more questions regarding the reality and morality of these issues. In Philip K. Dick's novel, to Android's stream of electric ship, were presented with a post-apocalyptic world filled with toxic dust fallout that was left on Earth after a major war. In this society, humanity decided to leave the destroyed Earth behind and started to populate Mars with colonies. In the New World, androids are issued as an incentive to every Earthling that decides to go to the New World. The only ones left on Earth are humans who do not pass the medical test due to the corruption of the fallout. Androids that have escaped the colonies and returned to Earth and the people that can't afford to move or that have jobs that require them to stay on the wasteland, like our protagonist Rick Deckard, a bounty hunter that retires escaped androids. And Android, or Andes for short, are near perfect replicas of humans. Detectives such as Rick employ an empathy test called Von Kampf that utilizes a series of questions to evoke involuntary human reactions meant to measure empathy, the only noticeable difference between humans and androids. So that's the answer then. I guess we don't need the video anymore, right? Just test the empathy? Ah, uh, I guess it's never that simple, huh? As we follow Rick on his adventures to retire these androids who are placed in situations that make us question the validity of this test, that only blur the line between android and human. As we start the book, Rick and his wife are arguing about what emotions they should be using on their mood organ, a machine that they use to choose their emotions they want to feel. And later on, we have a different bounty hunter, retired without a second thought, an android of a woman working as an opera singer that just wanted to know what it felt to be real. The opposite is true, as we see Rachel, a unit sent by Rosen Association, who manufactures the androids, romances Rick to humanize herself and her fellow androids, and attempts to convince Rick not to go after them. And the anguish felt by the leader of the androids when Rick retires his loved one. This forces Rick to admit that Andres was capable of love, and he himself had fallen in love with Rachel. Rick realizes that he has developed empathy for these machines, and there is evidence of these machines showing empathy for each other. This would violate the Korn Kopf test, making them human, or at least alive. These androids left Mars by killing their owners. This in and of itself could be grounds enough for their retirement process to make sense to anyone, as they are dangerous machines. But we have to take into account that these Andes were enslaved, forced to do whatever the owners wanted. And to that point, the murder could have even been considered an act of self-defense, and running away a dream for a better life. And I can't think of a more human response than having hope for a better future. A similar argument is made in the 2018 game Detroit Become Human. In this game, we follow three different storylines each led by an android. In this society, androids are used as a labor force that is slowly but steadily replacing humans. 
Androids are forced to obey humans in every task that they are set out to do, depriving them of any type of freedom. Connor is the first of the androids we are presented with, and much like Rick, who we discussed in the previous section, is in charge of hunting the deviant androids. A deviant is an android that has managed to override their orders and obtain free will. We are then introduced to Kara, the first android we see become deviant, who manages to disobey her orders to protect the child from her physically abusive father. She escapes with this child in an attempt to find a better life. And then Marcus, an android that was loved by his human owner with whom he had a father-son relationship. But due to his owner's jealous son, he is wrongly accused of attacking his owner and is shot and left in the junkyard, where he is presumed dead. The game plays out differently based on your actions, but in a good playthrough, we see each of the androids develop into beings that are very human. As Connor investigates the Deviant case, he becomes a close friend to Hank Anderson, a human detective working on this case as his partner. Besides forming a meaningful connection with a human, Connor starts to develop his own free will during this investigation, becoming a Deviant himself. This came about through empathy for another android, for his own race that he was so eager to chase after from the start of the game. Connor sees the mistreatment of each android making the motivation behind their crimes not only clear, but in some aspects understandable, such as an android that game ended his owner after he was beating him, making him fear for his own life, chasing Kara, seeing the length that she would go into to protect the child that she treated as her daughter, and a couple of deviants that just wanted to be together and game ended a man that was about to destroy one of them. This all culminates in a final test provided by Elijah Kamsky, the man who created the androids. Presented with the choice of learning what is causing the deviants to revolt in exchange for shooting one of Elijah's androids, Connor debates himself, if androids are really just machines, this would not be an issue. Destroying this android would not be any different than breaking your phone or hitting your TV, right? Yet, Connor refuses to destroy this android, becoming a deviant, but gaining the empathy that would have him as an equal to a human. Kara, attempting to protect her newfound daughter, Alice, from an abusive father was now left without hope, denied by humans who knew she was an android and betrayed by her own kind, who sent her to a sick man's house to be experimented with. She learned to care for herself and to be strong enough to take care of Alice, a task that developed into a love a mother has for her children, where she would do anything to protect her family. And Marcus, an android that had the perspective of being treated as an equal by his previous owner and father figure focuses on creating a world where both humans and androids are on an even field. It also depends on you, how you achieve this, but regardless of your route, both choices of a peaceful or a bloody revolution are marked by the hope of freedom and equality, only found in an indomitable human spirit. An android that can think, feel, love, and have hope is no different than you and me. It would be rather cruel to treat anything that could do all these things as a lesser being, just because of the nature of their birth or existence rather or due to difference in components, mechanical or organic. If you're still not convinced, think about it for a second. What if instead of an artificial intelligence inhabiting a mechanical body, it was your consciousness trapped inside a metal prison? Soma presents us with this exact situation, and then takes us for what I would call a horde-filled segment of multiple trolley problems while making us doubt our own existence and identity. We start as Simon Jarrett, a literature passionate Canadian. He was involved in a horrible traffic accident that ended up with his friend dead in the passenger seat, and him with brain trauma that has shortened his life expectancy tremendously. Luckily for him, some scientists working on their PhD are developing a solution to his problem, a brain scan that would allow them to run multiple simulations to test different treatments. This just might be the cure he was looking for, maybe there's still hope for him. Simon agrees to have this scan made for his brain to test his hypothesis. Sitting on the chair, he's ready as the scan runs and then... Darkness. Nothing is in there. The doctor's gone and he's alone in what seems to be a rundown vault of sorts. He soon discovers he's in Pathos 2, an oily water facility for mining, agriculture, deep sea construction, among other things. All these systems were overseen by the WoW, or White Artificial Intelligence used to maintain Motos Pathos 2 infrastructure, as it would be maintained and repaired by this intelligent gel. So what are we doing here if we're just in the doctor's office for a brain scan? Well, we had the scan done, 
but unfortunately, there was nothing that could have been done for Simon. So, how are we here right now, in the bottom of the ocean in this creepy facility? You see, the WoW, besides taking care of the facility, was also charged with preserving human life, as during the time between the first scan and our awakening in the facility, a meteor destroyed most of Earth, leaving only the people down in here alive. As this happened, the WoW really started working on preserving humanity, as it was instructed to do, so it started to combine people and machines to safeguard humanity's survival. We just so happened to have our scan done in the past, and the WoW created a copy with our brain scan. And we're now placing the combined body of a corpse and a machine, where our consciousness was uploaded by the WoW. As we traverse the facility, we're contacted by Catherine Chen, instructing us of our mission for the rest of the game. To upload ourselves to the Ark, which is a real life simulation, where we would leave our days for eternity, and send it to space, where the sun would serve as the power source to keep the simulation running until the sun itself collapses. During our journey, however, we're presented with other people like ourselves. Humans, or rather copies of consciousness that are trapped inside machines. Each encounter prompts us to consider whether or not these machines would be considered human, as we destroy some of them as required for us to progress. Some even question whether or not it would be inhuman to leave a living being in that current state. Someone stuck in a metal prison, not even being aware of their condition, forever trapped, unable to move on or to die deep below in the darkness of the ocean floor. Even you realize that you're just trapped on the same boat, or submarine I guess. You're not different than any of these machines that you have encountered. Once human, now a mind inside a machine. Have you lost your humanity? Are you the same Simon from back then? Simon even asked Catherine, if there's some kind of afterlife, do you think my place is taken? Catherine, of course, being another copy of the original Catherine that is long gone. With doubts in our head, we keep pushing as we're led by the hope of achieving this afterlife in the Ark, even if it's synthetic, where we'll finally be able to live. Our mission pushes us further down, where our robot body would not be able to bear the pressure of the deep sea, so we're in need of a change. We activate a new unit and transfer ourselves to a new body that can withstand this environment. Only then do we hear our previous body snoring. We can't transfer our mind. We're only creating a new duplicate, sending our new copy forward. It is here where we have the option of either destroying the battery supply of our old body or let our previous self live to wake up again along in the dark of this abyss. This idea was proposed by Derek Pardeth, first using the imaginary method of transportation. The thought experiment presented us with the idea of a device such as a teletransporter, which would destroy our being, reducing it into molecules. These molecules then are sent over space to a different location, where an identical copy of ourself is made from the exact atoms. Would this new creation still be our own self, or would this just be a copy, although an exact one, not quite the original one? He then twisted this thought experiment one more time. What if instead of moving from one place to another, we're just duplicated, such as that we have done with Simon? Would Simon be considered a human? Would his copy be? Would the copy of his copy? Where would we draw the line for this? Pushing aside the existential dread from these questions, we continue to push forward, finally reaching our destination, setting up a massive cannon that will shoot into space the Ark with a consciousness and Catherine's on it. And then, it happens. We make it. We manage to save what remains of humanity, by creating a simulation where we upload the consciousness of many other humans. But we're not there. I'm here. Catherine? Catherine? I'm here. What the hell happened? What went wrong? Nothing. They're out there, among the stars. We're here. No. We were getting on the Ark. I saw it. It finished loading just before it launched. Yeah, I saw. Then why are we still here? Simon, I can't keep telling you how it works. You won't listen. You know why we're here. You were copied onto the Ark. You just didn't carry over. You lost the coin toss. We both did. Just like Simon at Omicron. Just like the man who died in Toronto a hundred years ago. This is bullshit. We came all this way. We launched the Ark. I know it sucks. But our copies are up there. 
Catherine and Simon are both safe on the Ark. Be happy for them. Are you crazy? We're gonna die down here with those fuckers living at large on a spaceship. They're not us. They're not us. I'm sorry you feel that way, Simon. I'm proud of what we did. We made sure that something of the hundreds of thousands of years of human history survived, that something lives on. Fuck this! Fuck! Fuck this! Fuck you! Fuck you, Catherine! You lied! And I believed in you! I trusted you! You said we're getting on the fucking Ark! We are on the Ark, you idiot! I didn't lie! I can't be responsible for your goddamn ignorance! Fuck! Catherine? Please don't leave me alone. Catherine? Catherine? We lost the torn cost. And we're left behind on a mechanical body as Simon screams in agony in the face of this grim, lonely future that faces them. But it's... it's okay, right? We shouldn't feel any remorse for him. After all, he's just a robot, right? Having the memories of a human does not make that thing human. Even if every emotion that they feel is real, and it's just a clone, not even that, a machine attempting to replicate a human. So why do we feel this dread thinking of this terrible fate? What about the copy that was uploaded to the Ark? All of them really. Was humanity saved? Even if all that remains are digital copies of humans living in a digital world? As they all have a soul, but no body. Humanity incomplete, or just another form of existence. But what if the memories of another human were saved somewhere? to be uploaded into another person. A program uploaded to an organic new shell. We might just have an example from CD Projekt's red game Cyberpunk 2077. Anyone that visits Night City dreams of being someone, of becoming a legend, of having their names immortalized by their actions. We first start with B, the main character of the game, he or she depending on the gender you choose at the start of the game, is the vehicle that will take us for a ride on the dark and sketchy streets of Night City. Night City is a hyper-capitalistic setting, ruled by the corporations that operate within it, where crime rules and eddies, which is this world's currency, have the final say in any matter. V is one of the individuals that chooses to call this place home, running gig after gig to earn a living. One of these gigs starts what would be the main conflict of the game. Working with fixer Dexter Deshawn, we learn of a bioship, one we're asked to steal from Arasaka, one of the major corporations ruling the city. This mission, however, takes a wrong turn and we end up being the sole survivor of the gig, with the bioship encrusted on our head. This normally wouldn't be an issue as Reprodux could assist us with the removal of this chip, as well as it provide us with implants for any need that we could have in this cybernetic world. However, this chip is not like any other. The engram or memory of an individual is trapped inside it, and after a close to death experience, the consciousness of a... Um, for lack of a better word, very passionate political activist, Johnny Silverhand is now overriding our mind and his consciousness overtaking ours, gaining control of our body. With the clock ticking, it is now up to us to find a way to heal ourselves from this secure death, to rid us of the bioship. But would getting rid of the bioship be the best option? Even though our life is being overridden, is it okay to end someone else's life just to save our own? I mean, it is just an engram not really a living person, right? Just memories. But as we interact with Johnny, we realize that this copy is very aware of what it is, and yet, he feels so human. Although man-made, this chip holds a human being that is now lacking both a soul and a body. As it slowly takes over us, we start to think and agree with Johnny more and more. He himself takes characteristics of our own as well, creating a new being that is the mix of B and Johnny. Would this engram by itself be considered worthy of a life? Or should it be treated just like another program in any of our devices? What if, as one of the ending shows, we let this program take over us, over our body? Would that then be considered a living being? The only difference between the two is the casing of a biological body. But as presented previously with the android dilemma, we see that machines may have a realistic body but still not be considered one of us. So what determines where we draw the line? Should a machine be mistreated or taken advantage of just because they don't have an organic body? 
Despite being capable of feeling emotions, as well as having a large intellect, should a person or a copy of their consciousness no longer be considered alive if they just so happen to find themselves trapped in a machine, despite being human for all that time beforehand? And should a machine, on the other hand, or a program, be considered alive just because they obtain an organic body to encase themselves in? I leave all of you with these questions, not to create any existential dread on you, but as a precaution. Hunting the sea of empathy for our fellow machines as we quickly approach a time where these machines may become equal to us. Thank you all for watching.